Hi there, I'm Mary Logue, the manager of the Claremont Branch Library, and happy first day of June. This is Monday, so we are doing our weekly poetry reading, and today I am going to be reading poets from the Romantic period. I'm going to read poems from six of the major poets from William Blake, Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, Keats, Coleridge, and Wordsworth. So I'm going to read three or four, maybe five poems for each, and uh, I hope you enjoy the readings. So we're going to start with poems by William Blake, and I'm going to start with a poem which is the introduction to the Songs of Innocence. Piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee, on a cloud I saw a child, and he laughing said to me, Pipe a song about a lamb. So I piped with merry cheer. Piper, pipe that song again. So I piped, he wept to hear. Drop thy pipe, thy happy pipe, sing thy songs of happy cheer. So I sung the same again, and he wept with joy to hear. Piper, sit thee down and write in a book that all may read. So he vanished from my sight, and I plucked a hollow reed, and I made a rural pen, and I stained the water clear, and I wrote my happy songs every child may joy to hear. And the next poem I'm going to read is a famous one by Blake called The Lamb, since the previous poem mentioned writing a song or a poem about a lamb. So this is called The Lamb. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child, and thou a lamb, we are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. And the next poem is called, let me get there, On Another's Sorrow. <clears throat> Can I see another's woe, and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief, and not seek for kind relief? Can I see a falling tear and not feel my sorrow's share? Can a father see his child weep nor be with sorrow filled? Can a mother sit and hear an infant groan, an infant fear? No, no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. And can he who smiles on all hear the wren with sorrows small, hear the bird's grief and care, and hear the wo woes that infants bear, and not sit beside the nest, pouring pity in their breast, and not sit the cradle near, weeping tear on infant's tear, and not sit both night and day, wiping all our tears away. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. He doth give his joy to all, he becomes an infant small, he becomes a man of woe, he doth feel the sorrow too. And think not thou canst sigh a sigh, and thy maker is not by. Think not thou canst weep a tear, and thy maker is not near. Oh, he gives to us his joy, that our grief he may destroy. Till our grief is fled and gone, he doth sit by us and moan. And I'm going to read two more poems by Blake, and these are both from Songs of Innocence. And the first one is called The Clod and the Pebble. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care. But for another gives its ease, and builds a heaven in hell's despair. 
So sang a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet. But a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. And the last poem by Blake that we're going to read is another one that's very famous. You'll probably recognize the last and first stanza, and it is called The Tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So we're now going to move on to poems by Percy Shelley. And we are going to start with a poem called Ozymandias. And Ozymandias is the Greek name for the Egyptian monarch Ramsay II. So Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half-sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on that pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, and boundless and bare, the lone and level sands searched far away. The next poem is called Hymn to Beauty. The awful shadow of some unseen power floats, though unseen among us, visiting this various world with an inconstant wing, as summer winds that creep from flower to flower, like moonbeams that behind some piney mountain shower, it visits with inconstant glance each human heart and countenance, like hues and harmonies of evening, like clouds and starlight widely spread, like memory of music fled, like aught that for its grace may be, dear and yet dear, for its mystery. Spirit of beauty that dost consecrate, with thine own hues all thou dost shine upon, of human thought or form, where art thou gone? Why dost thou pass away and leave our state, this dim, vast veil of tears, vacant and desolate? Ask why the sunlight, not forever, weaves rainbows o'er yon mountain river? Why aught should fail and fade that once is shown, why fear and dream and death and birth cast on the daylight of this earth such gloom? Why man has such a scope for love and hate, despondency and hope? No voice from some sublimer world hath ever to sage or poet these responses given. Therefore the names of Damon, Ghost, and Heaven remain the records of their vain endeavor. Frail spells whose uttered charm might not avail to sever from all we hear and all we see, doubt, chance, and mutability. Thy light alone, like mist o'er mountains driven, or music by the night wind sent, through strings of some still instrument, or moonlight on a midnight stream, gives grace, grace and truth to life's unquiet dream. Love, 
hope, and self-esteem, like clouds depart, and come for some uncertain moments lent. Man were immortal and omnipotent, didst thou, unknown and awful as thou art, keep with thy glorious train firm state within his heart? Thou messenger of sympathy, sympathies that wax and wane in lovers' eyes, thou that to the human thought art nourishment, like darkness to a dying flame, depart not as thy shadow came, depart not lest the grave should be, like life and fear, a dark reality. While yet a boy I sought for ghosts, and sped, through many a listening chamber, cave, and ruin, and starlight wood with fearful steps pursuing, hopes of high talk with the departed dead. I called on poisonous names with which our youth is fed. I was not heard, I saw them not, when musing deeply on the lot of life at that sweet time when winds are wooing all vital things that wake to bring news of birds and blossoming. Sudden thy shadow fell on me. I shrieked and clasped my hands in ecstasy. I vowed that I would dedicate my powers to thee and thine. Have I not kept my vow? With beating heart and streaming eyes, even now I call the phantoms of a thousand hours. Each from his voiceless grave they have envisioned bowers of studious zeal or love's delight, outwatched with me the envious night. They know that never joy illumined my brow, unlinked with hope that thou wouldst free this world from its dark slavery, that thou, O awful loveliness, wouldst gift, give whate'er these words cannot express. The day becomes more solemn and serene. When noon is past, there is a harmony, in autumn and a luster in its sky, which through the summer is not heard or seen, as if it could not be, as if it had not been. Thus let thy power, which like thy truth, of nature on my passive youth, descended to my onward life supply, its calm, to one who worships thee, and every form containing thee, whom spirit fair thy spells did bind, to fear himself and love all humankind. So I have two more poems by Shelley that I'm going to read, and the first one is called The Moon. And like a dying lady, lean and pale, who totters forth, wrapped in a gauzy veil, out of her chamber, led by the insane and feeble wanderings of her fading brain. The moon arose up in the murky east, a white and shapeless mass. Art thou pale for weariness of climbing heaven and gazing on earth, wandering companionless among the stars that have a different birth, and ever changing like a joyless eye that finds no object worth its constancy. And the last one by Shelley that I'm going to read is called Lines. When the lamp is shattered, the light in the dust lies dead. When the cloud is scattered, the rainbow's glory is shed. When the lute is broken, sweet tones are remembered not. When the lips have spoken, Loved accents are soon forgot. As music and splendor survive not the lamp and the lute, the heart's echoes render no song when the spirit is mute. No song but sad dirges, like the wind through a ruined cell, or the mournful surges that ring a dead seaman's knell. When hearts have once mingled, love first leaves the well-built nest. The weak one is singled to endure what it once possessed. O oh, love who bewailest the frailty of all things here, why choose you the frailest for your cradle, your home, your beer? Its passions will rock thee as the storms rock the ravens on high. Bright reason will mock thee like the sun from a wintry sky. From thy nest every rafter will rot and thine eagle home leave thee naked to laughter when leaves fall and cold winds come. So we're going to move on to poems by Lord Byron, and I have three poems here to read. And the first one is called When We Two Parted. 
when we two parted in silence and tears, half broken hearted to sever for years. Pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss. Truly that hour foretold sorrow to this. The dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow. It felt like a warning of what I feel now. Thy vows are all broken, and light is thy fame. I hear thy name spoken, and share in its shame. They name thee before me, a knell to mine ear. A shudder comes o'er me, why wert thou so dear? They know not I knew thee, who knew thee too well. Long, long shall I rue thee, too deeply to tell. In secret we met, in silence I grieve, that thy heart could forget, thy spirit deceive. If I should meet thee after long years, how should I greet thee with silence and tears? Next poem, also by Lord Byron, is called We'll Go No More A Roving. So we'll go no more a roving, so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving, and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul wears out the breast, and the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a roving by the light of the moon. And lastly, by Lord Byron, is Stanzas for Music. There be none of beauty's daughters with a magic like thee, and like music on the waters is thy sweet voice to me, when, as if its sound were causing the charmed oceans pausing, the waves lie still and gleaming, and the lulled winds seem dreaming, and the midnight moon is weaving her bright chain o'er the deep, whose breast is gently heaving as an infant's asleep. So the spirit bows before thee to listen and adore thee with a full but soft emotion like the swell of summer's ocean. So that finishes our third poet, and we're going to be moving on to poems by John Keats. So I have four of those poems for you. And we're going to start with a poem called When I Have Fears. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleamed my teeming brain, before high-piled books in character hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel, fair creature of the hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. And the next poem is called To Sleep. O soft embalmer of the still midnight, shutting with careful fingers and benign, our gloom pleased eyes embowered from the light, and shaded in forgetfulness divine. O soothest sleep, if so it please thee, close in the midst of this thine hymn, my willing eyes, or wait the amen ere the poppy throws. Around my bed its lulling charities. Then save me, or the passive day will shine Upon my pillow, breeding many woes. Save me from curious conscience that still lords Its strength for darkness, burrowing like a mole. Turn the key deftly in the oiled wards, And seal the hushed casket of my soul. My last poem by John Keats will be To Autumn. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, 
to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor thy hair soft lifted by the widowing wind or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep drowsed with the fume of poppies while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook or by a cedar press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours where are the songs of spring ay where are they think not of them thou hast thy music too while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourne hedge crickets sing and now with soft with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft and gathering swallows twitter in the skies so now we're going to move on to our second to last poet and that's samuel taylor coleridge and we're going to start with one of his famous poems that you'll probably recognize the first few lines of and it's called Kubla Khan, or A Vision in a Dream. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran, through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground, with walls and towers were girdled round, and here were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain moment, momently was forced, amid whose swift half-intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks, and at once and ever, it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles meandering with mazy motion, through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer, in a vision, once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played. Sing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song? To such a deep delight t'would win me, that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, Beware, beware! His flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. So we're going to continue with Coleridge, and I will get my other book here and we will be reading a poem called Youth and Age which I found very fitting as I am getting ready to get a year older in this month. So here is Youth and Age 
by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Verse, a breeze mid blossoms straying, where hope clung feeding like a bee. Both were mine. Life went a maying with nature, hope, and posy when I was young. When I was young? Ah, woeful when! Ah, for the change twixt now and then. This breathing house not built with hands, this body that does me grievous wrong, or airy cliffs and glittery sands, how lightly then it flashed along, like those trim skiffs unknown of yore, on winding lakes and rivers wide, that ask no aid of sail or oar, that fear no spe spite of wind or tide, not cared this body for wind or weather, when youth and I lived in it together. Flowers are lovely, love is flower-like, friendship is a sheltering tree. Oh, the joys that came down shower-like of friendship, love, and liberty, ere I was old. Ere I was old, ah, woeful ere, which tells me youth's no longer here. O oh, youth, for years so many and sweet, tis known that thou and I were one. I'll think it but a fond conceit, it cannot be that thou art gone. Thy vesper bell hath not yet tolled, and thou wert I a masker bold. What strange disguise hast now put on, to make believe that thou art gone? I see these locks and silvery slips, this drooping gait, this altered size, but springtide blossoms on thy lips, and tears take sh sunshine from thine eyes. Life is but thought, so think I will, that youth and I are housemates still. Dewdrops are the gems of morning, but the tears of mournful eve. Where no hope is, life's a warning, that only serves to make us grieve, when we are old. That only serves to make us grieve, with oft and tedious taking leave, like some poor nigh related guest, that may not rudely be dismissed, yet hath outstayed his welcome well, and tells the jest without a smile. So, next poem, also by Coleridge, is called Time, Real and Imaginary, an Allegory. On the wide level of a mountain's head, I knew not where, but twas some fairy place, their pinions ostrich-like, for sails outspread, Two lovely children run an endless race, a sister and a brother. This far outstripped the other, yet ever runs she with reverted face, and looks and listens for the boy behind, for he, alas, is blind. Or rough and smooth with even step he passed, and knows not whether he be first or last. And my last poem by Coleridge is called Work Without Hope. All nature seems at work, slugs leave their lair, the bees are stirring, birds are on the wing, and winter, slumbering in the open air, wears on his smiling face a dream of spring, and I, the while, the sole unbusy thing, nor honey make, nor pair, nor build, nor sing. Yet well I ken the banks where amaranths blow, have traced the fountain whence streams of nectar flow. Bloom, O ye amorites, bloom for whom ye may, for ye, me ye bloom not. Glide rich streams away, with lips unbrightened, wreathless brow I stroll, and would you learn the spells that drowse my soul? Work without hope draws, a ne draws nectar in a sieve, and hope without an object cannot live. So we are going to move on to our last poet for the day, and this is William Wordsworth, and I have four poems by him to read to you. The first is called Upon Westminster Bridge. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by, a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear, the beauty of the morning silent, bare. Ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie, open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air, 
Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt, a calm so deep. The river glideth at its own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. The next poem is a very short one, and it is called The Rainbow. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be, bound each to each by natural piety. And this poem is called The Perfect Woman. She was a phantom of delight when first she gleamed upon my sight, a lovely apparition sent to be a moment's ornament. Her eyes as stars of twilight fair, like twilight's too, her dusky hair. But all things else about her drawn from maytime and the cheerful dawn. A dancing shape, an image gay, to haunt, to startle, and waylay. I saw her upon nearer view, a spirit, yet a woman too, her household motions light and free, and steps of virgin liberty, a countenance in which did meet sweet records, promises as sweet, a creature not too bright or good for human nature's daily food, for transient sorrows, simple wiles, praise, blame, love, kisses, tears, and smiles. And now I see with eye serene the very pulse of the machine, a being breathing thoughtful breath, a traveler between life and death, the reason firm, the temperate will, endurance, foresight, strength, and skill, a perfect woman nobly planned to warn, to comfort, and command, and yet a spirit still and bright with something of angelic light. And the poem I am going to end with uh, for the day is a, The Solitary Reaper. Behold her, single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing by herself. Stop here, or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds the grain, and sings a melancholy strain. Oh, listen, for the veil profound is overflowing with the sound. No nightingale did ever chaunt more welcome notes to weary bands of travelers in some shady haunt among Arabian sands. A voice so thrilling ne'er was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird. Breaking the silence of the seas among the far farthest Hebrides, will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old unhappy far-off things and battles long ago? Or is it something more humble lay, familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow, loss, or pain, that has been and may be again? Would e'er the theme the maiden sang, as if her song could have no ending, I saw her singing at her work, and o'er the sickle bending. I listened, motionless and still, and, as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore, long after it was heard no more. That's the last poem I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the poems from our romantic poets, and perhaps some of the lines or things will stick with you throughout the week. Hopefully it's enough to make you want to hear more poetry next week. So come back next week, next Monday at 11, and I will be reading some odes and some sonnets. So I hope you have a good week and I will look forward to sharing poetry with you again next week.